point I'm trying to get to is here that Northrop borrowed a bunch of money and bought TRW Space Systems, the number one think tank on your planet. Who gave you the green light? I can't answer that. All I can say is that the easiest way for me to say what I'm saying is my association with three Nordic people in Douglas on the Apollo program. During World War II, Germany was taking extraterrestrial information and uh, putting in production uh, 12, 14 different extraterrestrial type vehicles. They're right. manufacturing them using slain labor. Almost 90% of that was taken out of Germany before the war even stopped. It was taken to Antarctica and is still operating there today. That there are some positive artificial intelligence out there, but that we do have incoming races of beings that are actually artificially intelligent, you know. Yeah, you can't even see them. Then they put the American flag up, okay? And then they start walking around taking their pictures. And all around the edge of the crater are all these great big things, which so are... The, they're, they're, his, 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 his statement, Armstrong, Sir, you've got to see these. They're massive. They're threatening. They're threatening us. So, what I want to say again is you're saying everything was planned to 1999 and basically we were stopped at a certain point and that's a very, you know, um, crisis point in your book which is very exciting but at the same time very disappointing to hear. So. It's it does it's not surprising because in in a sense the general public certainly thinks we never went back to the moon that that's what they had in their minds. Um, now I don't believe that. So it went black in essence, yes. and and this gets into a whole nother area. But I'm going to ask you my question in a minute. So Michael, we were just about to you were just about to tell him in answer to his question, right? We were talking about that. I also wanted to discuss. Uh, Bill, have you ever got a chance to meet Ben Rich? No. You didn't? No, okay. I didn't. I wish I had. Okay. Uh, because he's beautiful people. Do you think that um, Donald Douglas Sr. consulted with Kelly Johnson and secrets were traded? Do you think that's uh, something that... No question. No question. No question. Can yes. you drill down on that a little bit? Uh, well, uh, Donald Douglas was far more important in this whole thing than, than people realize. I'm not trying to give him a, 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 a big deal, but he certainly was. And so he, for instance, uh, knew Northrop. And uh, uh, I want to sort of level out on Northrop because remember, TRW systems that came on after all of this early program things, uh, TRW came out of the Douglas Think Tank. That's where it came from. And uh, so TRW then had what constitute, I worked there for a number of years, they had unlimited funds to literally study anything, okay? Any subject you want. So uh, the TRW staff, the president and Many of the top engineers were in the Douglas secret think tank before. And so not only uh, did Douglas talk to uh, TRW, but Douglas talked to Northrop. Douglas talked to Lockheed. These fellows um, were not exchanging information because they were competition with each other. But at a technical level, they talked together. And they then, uh, like the first package that I flew to Lockheed at, at, uh, uh, in the valley there uh, was the first paper that Lockheed had which formed 
the think tank, the think tank. And so collectively, uh, the information was individual for each of the companies that we flew packages to, but there was also coordination between, like Douglas Singer, and the top people at Lockheed. And uh, it's not that they were trading information, but they were at the same level diplomatically, and they communicated. And so Ben Rich, uh, um, what, what he said before he passed away, I think is extremely important because he, in one statement, he came up with what the real situation was. And he's leaving that with, okay, it's your, you guys' next move. It's, it's your next move. This is what he's telling you. Uh, it's there. Uh, you can leave it. You can back off or you can participate. I think those words were unreal, truthfully. That's sort of a box of the whole situation. And uh, those guys in the skunk works at Lockheed were right on, okay? Now, I did work for Lockheed three different times. One, I worked for Nav Space. I was working for Nav Space in a facility inside of Lockheed. I, I delivered documents to Lockheed actually four times, and I worked for Lockheed two other times. I actually worked as an, as an, uh, um, as a research um, wind tunnel model expert, okay? So, and, and that was the first time I actually worked for Lockheed, but I had delivered packages to Lockheed 10 years earlier. And uh, so my participation with them was then different than my participation with Northrop because I actually worked for Northrop for two and a half years. And the point I'm trying to get to is here that Northrop borrowed a bunch of money and bought TRW Space Systems, the number one think tank on your planet. Holy cats. Um, I mean, this is wild. Northrop borrowed some money. They went to Virginia. They bought the U.S. Navy's shipbuilding company that builds aircraft carriers. <laughs> the massive number one facility on the planet that builds aircraft carriers. Now listen to this. What did they do that for? So they could take their engineers, crawl all over aircraft carriers, look at it, and figure out how to make a 790-foot aircraft carrier into a kilometer-long spacecraft carrier? What better tool could you buy? Wow. I think that when we address all of these things that the different people have done, it's mind-boggling. I mean, it really is. And you okay, well, what about, what about Boeing? Okay, Boeing is also involved with building... And Rockwell. And Rockwell, building spacecraft carriers. Uh, and, and Rockwell... And also what we call... Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here because I worked on a short, very short-term assignment for, I think it was Boeing, and I was working for the top guy, and they were going to be designing these, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm not good with this stuff, but, you know, F-35 or whatever kind yeah, of plane. Okay. Yeah. And at all of a sudden, they designed a Starship Enterprise, and they took the whole division and like in two weeks time or less and you know that aerospace is they move very slow normally at least yeah. in the public yeah. domain they packed everything up and they shipped it all down to uh, a location somewhere like redondo beach i don't know where it was uh further south like mm -hmm. maybe even further south than redondo beach um and they took some of the employees and not, i don't know about all but i mean it happened so quickly, but I was working for the top guy, so I know that that's what they went to build. <laughs> Fabulous. <Yeah. laughs> 
So. Ties right in. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you, you know, you're right on it, uh, and and you know, and it was exciting because they were excited yeah. to be packing up and going to do this exciting new project, and I almost you know wished I could go with them, you know, right. but of course that wasn't my line of work. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, it's fascinating when what goes on now. What you're basically describing, though, is a secret space program that went secret kind of like gradually in a, in a certain way because some of this stuff was out in the public domain, right? Yes, it was, yes. And yet the secrecy became more and more dense over the years. And I know a lot of people are puzzled by that. So have you got an evaluation or a critique of how the secrecy got so tight? Is it the, the infiltration of the reptilians and the fact that you've got Nordics on one side, reptilians on the other, influencing the program? Well, that's, that's one of the keys, yes. Yeah. And then you have the Dracos uh, influencing the president of your country. Uh, and uh, so this... Okay, so are we talking Eisenhower, Truman, who are talking, all of them? Yeah, all of them. Really? All of them. Okay, and all but I with, thought the president doesn't have any real power. Does uh, he? Uh, he has some po power. Much of this was kept secret from that level. Okay, but MJ twelve is behind the scene, uh, you know, orchestrating a lot of this as well. And you're saying this guy Douglas is part of MJ twelve yes. in the early days, yeah. right? So he's very instrumental. Yes, and actually, for him to talk. You know, two of the Navy admirals and two of the Army Air Force generals to put together a, the most advanced study group on the planet and put it into a secret tank inside of Douglas Engineering. I mean, uh, yes, it separated uh, several years later, but Douglas put this together himself based on the Los Angeles event. Right. I mean, was, this is staggering. Was Rand around during that time, or, or no, was that No, Rand came out of the think tank. Oh. Uh, actually, there was this divorce that I talked about so in the book. So you had TRW and Rand? Was it like that? Well, uh, Rand, uh, because of manufacturing taking over all control of Douglas and removing it from Douglas Sr., okay, they did. And so they didn't want any of this extraterrestrial stuff in their company. They wanted to make airplanes. I don't want to. I don't want them even here. So, them finding out about this secret thing blew the whistle. So, Rand was formed inside the secret think tank at Douglas, and then there was this big divorce. The divorce took place roughly eight months before I went to work in 1951, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, they divorced, they built, they used this building right in Santa Monica as their headquarters. But then, Rand went worldwide. And uh, if you go down to San Diego and you go out to Point Loma so you can get a view of, of San Diego, you go up to the top there where the view is, <clears throat> as you went out there, on your left side, underground, that's all ran. On the right side is nav space, underground, on both sides. You're there looking at the San Diego. Right over here is all of this massive ran thing, and all the way back on this side, nav space. I'm, you, you don't realize what came out of the Douglas think tank. How many years is this? That's 70 years ago. I mean, this is crazy. Okay, but let's also talk about NASA a little bit. Okay. Uh, because at a certain point, I mean, you're coming from Douglas. This is a aerospace, com well, an aircraft company, yeah. and you're you're bringing changes to Apollo that affect NASA. Yes. Okay. And top dogs at NASA are Debus and von, von Braun, and they're Nazis. Yes. And they really were Nazis. They were. They were okay. SS. And uh, they 
um, okay, so it appears from your book even that NASA is maybe the first place that's infiltrated by Nazis and that ideology. Yes, that's correct. And uh, so Paperclip was not just 10 or 12 German fellows coming here. It was a massive number of a tremendously massive organization that a little bit of it went to Moscow. All the rest went to, to Antarctica in those big caverns in Antarctica. You got 5%. Meaning U.S.? U.S., yes. Okay, but Britain got some. Yeah, Britain, yeah, there's little bits. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, Von Braun and Debus, were both principals in that organization in Germany. And so we, you say, well, we got good ones. There were other good ones, too, that the Russians got. And many of them uh, were still uh, managing construction of extraterrestrial spacecraft carriers, which were being built underground in Germany during World War II. Okay. You mean when they came to work for us, they were continuing? No. During World War II, Germany was taking extraterrestrial information and uh, putting in production uh, 12, 14 different extraterrestrial type vehicles. They're right. manufacturing them using slave labor. Almost 90% of that was taken out of Germany before the war even stopped. It was taken to Antarctica and is still operating there today. Right. New Berlin. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. So is that why uh, John Kerry went down to, New, you know, to Antarctica while we had a presidential election being held? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, I have whistleblowers who've talked about yes. Antarctica, and I've released information about this. Now, I'm not a whistleblower, okay? I am simply an individual You're who has been... You're by, by the military. That's a whole different ballgame. Okay. All right. You know, you're coming from a completely different angle. Most of the people that I deal with uh, have worked in a bub block top secret Okay, they may I may even have worked with you or near you, but they have come out of the organization. Then then they start talking, uh, in some cases violating their uh, security agreements. Okay, I don't know what that's all about, but uh, I am just trying to put it aside. I understand, but this is a, a radical change for the military to be actually bringing one of their own forward in this way. And I wonder if your um, your enthusiasm is going to is it going to be catching? Are there going to be others like you? This is what we're hoping will take place. That's what I'm hoping will take place, because <clears throat> the public needs to know about this. The country needs to know about it. The planet needs to know about what has taken place. And we've been lied to. I say this over and over. We've all been lied to for a minimum of 6,000 years. Uh, every country, every European country, every Asian country. Okay, but let's get into, and I apologize to you, but you know, this is so important. Why do we need to know now? Because I get the feeling that you're actually coming forward at a critical time because of something coming. Okay, you could say that. I could say, in my opinion, I hope that this is going to take place. Okay, I'm hoping that, right. uh, that this will benefit uh, release of this subject. That's my hope. That's okay, but but is you know why are they choosing now? I mean, you were sitting around. You know, are you're really 93? Yes. So you were sitting around. I assume. I mean, you were a fantastically busy person building all these things and designing all these things but at some point you must have sort of retired and and been you know less busy yet less utilized by them okay. and you must have 
you know, even during the time you're writing your book. And I know that Bob would talk to you back in 2009. And I think there was some kind of interaction with you with some other reporters or somebody back in 2002 or something like that. And this is what was written in the back of your book. And yet you basically had the lid was on everything you were doing. And, and even Bob Wood didn't come forward with the interview he'd done with you back in 2009 until one year ago, almost one year ago to, to now, when somebody in the, or, the organization who's bringing you forward contacted, it appears, Michael Sala. Okay, uh, Michael Salas, uh, uh, he's done his homework. Okay, uh -huh. now, uh, and uh, he's a nice guy too. But sure. through freedom of information, unlike many people, he has taken the time and taken all the hits of, of not releasing the information, okay? And then eventually getting substantiation for Riccobata, Admiral Riccobata, before he took over Naval Air Station San Diego, okay? Mm -hmm. He went to Lockheed, he went to uh, Douglas, and he went over to Northrop, he goes to, uh, to North American. Uh, what is this all about? And four to six weeks later, Bill Tompkins takes packages to these people. What is this all about? That's now been verified through freedom of information that Michael Salas has got, and he's got a great deal more information. He's been pulling substantiation for the things we're talking about here, mm -hmm. okay? Verifying it, and... Uh, okay, but that doesn't, it doesn't explain why it took you that long to come forward, who gave you the green light at a certain juncture one year, approximately one year ago, to come forward? Well, actually, it's not like what happened one year ago. That, I don't even know what that answer right. is, because uh, let's go back to the south part of Oregon and uh, this Navy League Council that I set up in Oregon. and. Uh, I had my ship models. I put them in the uh, big mall. We could talk about it. There was an article in the paper that uh, some people in, uh, in, in downtown uh, Medford, Oregon, were going to have a Navy League Council. And uh, so uh, I get the, the information in the paper, and then I have people calling us. I stood in the center of the mall. Uh, three weekends. Uh, I had a little place there with documentation about the Navy League and I got uh, um, 70, 80 people within about three months and we formed this Navy League Council. Okay. What year was this? Um, this was uh, 2009, 2007 time period. Uh, and I, I contact uh, the commander, Naval Air Station, uh, Naval Base, uh, Washington, D.C., who's commander of subgroup nine, <clears throat> the Boomer subs. Uh, and I talk to him, and I talk him into coming down to Medford, Oregon, in the big restaurant there, and throwing holy water on this new Navy League Council. And admirals don't do that. Admirals don't do that. Maybe a lieutenant does, or maybe a commander, or a lieutenant commander. Admirals don't do that, okay? Don't ask me how that happened. Somebody threw a little bit of whatever, and this admiral, who has a fantastic background himself on the subject, so we throws holy water on 
uh, Navy League Council and the Boondocks okay. down but in. Are we talking Bobby Ray Inman at this point? No, we're talking a different Another guy one. entirely. A yeah. different admiral. Yeah. Can we know his name or not? Uh, I'd rather not put it in now, but right. I'm just saying. Uh, so, so no. I, what, what I need to say to yeah. you and to help you in your understanding here, again, for whatever reason, uh, I end up with some 70 retired naval top officers in this council, and you can't justify that in a boonie town in southern Oregon that all is there is just chopping down logs. All right. Okay? Okay. Now, I can't give you the answer. I can't give you the answer of why just south of Medford there's a mountain. And there's a mountain there where all of these Navy officers, most of these Navy officers are in business who they have their own airplanes. They fly all over the United States and Canada. They see UFOs coming south, coming from the east, mm -hmm. going into the side of this mountain. Where is it, this isn't Mount Shasta, is it? Mount Shasta. It is, okay. And so they take their airplanes and they fly collectively for seven, eight, nine planes trying to find the door. <laughs> and they don't find the door. And then while they're doing this, two of them come out. Right. Just next to them, fly right past their airplanes. That's pretty awesome. Oh my yeah. gosh. What did you say? Uh, so, so what are all these, how do you are, know, look, you're, you're in contact even to this day with Nordics, you're being influenced, you're being communicated with. Telepathically. Telepathically. Yes. Okay, so that's what they did. They basically kind of telepathically said, this will, hey Bill, this will be a great idea for you. <laughs> you'll yeah. go down, you'll start this association, and if you build it, they will come, right? Is and they did. It? Yeah. And they okay, did. and they did, but I, I can't justify, okay? Why in the world would we have that many top off? One is a, at a Marine General. Yeah. We had seven captains. Well, I can, I can help a little bit with this because uh, as a, a, tele, a psychic, whatever you want to call it, I can say that I did go to Shasta and I was communicated with by the Telos people who had told me it was an um, extremely sad story about how the <clears throat> reputation the re uh, reptilians had taken over Shasta and that their their whole civilization was at risk. So they perhaps were sending out the, you know, signal, and this was in 2010. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we're pretty close in dates here yeah. as to when your thing happened. So uh, you were kick-starting the whole operation. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, uh -huh. I, I, it, and that was very moving for me and very shocking, very shocking. Yeah. And it was evident also in the terrain. You could actually see there was a frequency fence of some kind that had been put up in that area that was actually killing the, uh, the, the, the wildlife and the, the, um, yes. the, the pine trees and everything. You could see everything was starting to die. Yeah. Which, you know. I, I have to say it's really almost laughable that you have all these Navy officers, they're all in business, which requires them to have an airplane. They fly, they're talking back and forth between their airplanes. One guy's coming east, the other guy's north, and uh, one comes out of the mountain here, another guy comes in on the other side, and then actually when two of them are flying together, they come right out and go between the two airplanes. I mean, this, I, I, and, and then you say there's no UFOs, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, to me. Uh, well, I don't say there's no. no I'm, I'm being facetious. Yeah, I know. What we, you mean. we collectively say there's yes. no such thing as extra. I mean, it's yes, of course, and that's back, you know, back in the ABCs of yeah. this whole subject matter. But amazing stuff, uh, really. It's just amazing, and so that that uh, that does answer some of my question in that small way, you okay. know, of yeah. how that this thing germinated to where we we are now talking today, but. 
Michael, I, I want to, I know this is jumping back a bit. That's okay, that's all right. I'm, I'm but okay. Did you get your question answered I, about I, the moon? Yeah, I think so. I want to just kind of get back on that really quickly. Uh, Bill, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed at Tranquility Base on July 20th of 1969, were they given foreknowledge of what they were going to find when they got there, or were they just flying blind and they, they saw? They sort of had foreknowledge. Let me tell you why, <laughs> okay? We talk about these, you've heard, you've heard their comments about, oh my gosh, there are other crafts out here. Um, this is before you get to the moon. They're flying from here to the moon. And uh, so then they, uh, they describe some of these, okay? Uh, very, one or two of the very large kilometer or two kilometer long spacecraft carriers came in from one side of the uh, Apollo control module. So the Apollo's coming here, this vehicle is coming in like it's going to go exactly into the vehicle, our vehicle. And of course it makes the turn and uh, you essentially get the feeling you're being given the finger, okay? So you go on, uh, you make your rotation around, you get all set up uh, and uh, to land. And so as you're landing from down behind the crater, <laughs> uh, these vehicles come up and park, okay? Some of the guys come out and they stand there underneath on the edge of the crater. So we, we got two guys here and another guy still going around the planet up there, which he has to get back into. And they're doing their thing. They're, they're, well, again, they didn't put the flag up first. They put up a Freemason flag, and then they got this great Freemason plaque, which they put down, and they, the Freemasons take over the moon, right? Okay, that's what the plaque is for. With the with these reptilians watching. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so not, not so now theory. then they put the American flag up. Okay. And then they start walking around taking their pictures. And all around the edge of the crater are all these great big things. Which so are, the, 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 his, 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 his statement, Armstrong. Sir, you've got to see these. They're massive. They're threatening. They're threatening us. Wow. Did Neil Armstrong take motion picture film footage of these vehicles? Yes. He did? Yeah. Okay. And what do you think was the the talk inside the command module when they re with Michael Collins? What do you think Buzz and Neil told Michael Collins? <laughs> what was that, that discussion about? Oh my God, yeah. first of all, okay, really, because this is, this is a totally, now, remember, uh, we had sent, sent up vehicles with cameras on them to go around the moon to try to figure out, you know, all of the requirements, not only for the selection of where the landing was going to be, but try to come up with some sort of a feel of what our situation was going to be when we got there. Okay, so that's all been going on before. So we have seen and we have photographed uh, structures on the other side of the moon. And next to those structures, a ways away, are foundations of many different buildings that are there. So we've already photographed, we knew that. Okay, well I'm gonna go back even further than that though, because we know the Nazis have been to the moon, right? Yeah. You, you admitted that, and not only that, but one of my witnesses, uh, Mark Richards, is Captain Mark Richards from the Secret Space Program, from Space Command. He is a Navy, uh, he was a Navy officer yeah. on the side of the Navy, and he was, I don't know if you've ever heard of one of the craft that he was famous for flying, which is called Minerva, which is an artificially intelligent craft. 
vehicle. Very few vehicle that very few people can apparently even interact with, let alone drive. Yeah. So okay. he, he's in prison in Northern California mm -hmm. uh, because he's, I guess, the, he's been framed for murder and he's the enemy of the reptilians who are in office and Dracos. Uh, but he said that, that by the 60s and early 60s, we had a base on the moon, even though we'd been told, no, we couldn't. Okay. And he said um, that's because Curtis LeMay wouldn't take no for an answer. Could be. I don't know. That sounds a lot you don't like know Curtis about that. Well, I don't know. Okay. But that could be possible. All right. Okay. And he read your book because I sent it to him. And he mm -hmm. said it lines up with everything he knows. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry he's in prison. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, you know, with your, with your revelations, maybe someone would, could actually turn some, some keys somewhere and, and get him out. Yeah. He's, you know, he's, he's an, almost an elderly man at this point. He's, he's in his late 60s, I think. Oh, okay. Not, like, not as old as you. Yeah. But uh, he, he was chosen the same way you were, he said, in when he was yeah. very young. Yeah, well, that's where I was trying to get back to him, that right. it's not just one or two people that are selected, okay? Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of these people actually all over the planet. There's Russians, too, and there's Chinese. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so, but unfortunately, not making this nice, uh, some are on their white hats, and we like them, but we've got a lot of people with black hats that are, that are selected to implement whatever. And this is a real problem. Um, uh, and you can't cover this part of it up and just say, I don't believe that, okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, we are stuck with situations, plural, not one, but situations with which we don't have control over. And we are being used, we have been being used, and I hate to say this, but we're just a laboratory for them. Stop and think, that's not your moon, this is not your planet, and they own the planet, and we are their lab. We're their laboratory, and their associates' laboratories, other extraterrestrials right. coming in, doing their agenda. Yes. And, and no, and this has been going on for eons, and we know about this, but I have to say there is, uh, there is a reason for all of this, and yeah. I, I want to get to this idea that the Nordics are coming here. Mark said the same thing to me. Around the same time you're releasing this, he was saying to me on my one-on-one -on -one interview with him in prison, I go to interview him in prison, I've done it five times now, and he said, the Nordics are, want the humans to come up to speed militarily and in terms of consciousness, etc., so that they can join the fight against the reptilians and dracos that are basically plundering the galaxies, um, taking over planets, etc., and you've said something very similar to that. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Uh, I'm just saying that this, this is our, our situation. <laughs> and it's... Uh, uh, and our military uh, is very aware of this. And so what they've been doing is funneling what we call Black Project money, billions into building this secret space program that's now... Uh, practically what we call a rogue civilization. It's, it's almost living, it's living so far in advance of the way we live in terms of technology and in terms of everything else. Okay, adding to that, you have Solar Warden. People don't believe that we have Solar Warden, okay? I believe it, Okay, yeah. uh, but it is eight Navy space battle groups with destroyers, cruisers, other vehicles, support vehicles, uh, uh, transports, uh, trucks, all kinds of stuff. They're operating off of Nordic bases, okay? Uh, their families, their children 
live in Nordic facilities. They go to Nordic restaurants for food. Uh, just like the six people in Lockheed, which are here, uh, working or they have their own facilities in an area in Burbank. Uh, those six fellows have wives and children. They're in the public schools there. Um, they go to restaurants and, and they go. And nobody knows their names. And uh, the, the manager of that six group, uh, they are, uh, they have their own mission, which again is talking about this region of the galaxy, this arm. Uh, and so they could just as well have been on board the moon facilities but they're local, and yes, once in a while they help the Skunk Works, but that's not their job, they're not contracted. And okay, he lives 3,700 comparable years, and so does the, do the children, the wife, okay? Right. Uh, the, the children go to the schools, but every hour they put in class, they're being taught telepathically their own information because they can finish a four-year college degree by nine years old. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sure. And they're, they're right here in Burbank. Uh, now, yes, we've got all this other stuff out there, too, that's being operated in the same manner. And those people are... Uh, they're not necessarily here as a contract to help Lockheed, but yes, they do once in a while talk with the Skunk Works, make side issues, make side suggestions. Uh, so, okay, but what? What about you? Because you're 93 years old. Are have you? Did were you not offered to live 3,000 years, or did you? What's your, you know, relationship with them? Are they just, you know, giving you upgrades so you lasted even this long? Or are they going to allow you to leave the earth and, you know, leave this body, this vehicle, and go back and, and join okay. them? Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk for a minute about uh, extended life. Yeah. Okay? Now, extended life didn't start here in the United States last week. Okay, mm -hmm. extended life um, was even implemented into the information that the Draco reptilian group educated some of the German people. So, um, no doubt about it. I yeah. Have, I now, so again, you say, well, what's extended life? Extended life was heavily involved in in the secret think tank inside of Douglas. Okay, another subject. But then at TRW, where I worked later on, uh, it was a really big program. I mean, really big program with hundreds of people involved. Okay. But even before that, the Nazis were reverse aging people. Yes. So I have a witness about that who actually said Werner von Braun was one of them. Okay, I've heard that. I don't know that. All right. Uh, I, 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 uh, Dr. Debus, um, all I got was he shaked his head. So I don't know that when that came up. He shaked his head no or yes? <laughs> uh, no. Uh -huh. So maybe he was, I don't know. Right. All right. Well, who, but, why would they tell us? Yeah, but but what, okay. whatever. Uh, and I spent a lot of time with that whole week with uh, <clears throat> essentially the number one guy managing NASA. Okay. Right. Uh, Von Braun was supposedly the head of everything. Debus was the real head of everything. Okay. <clears throat> okay, back to extended life. As it is sort of addressed today, uh, what you do 
is you take an aspirin sized pill one every month for four months okay or it could be an injection <clears throat> immediately you start feeling much better okay immediately you start feeling much better at the end of or probably way before four months uh, the guys revert back to the latest number is 29 I've heard 23 I've heard all different dates but say you go back to 29 so you've got everything physically that you had at that age muscular everything uh, and the young ladies go back to 21 okay you have everything that you had at that point plus you have a minimum of 400 percent greater capability of your brain okay okay so that you have said that on other shows now i want to know again what's their relationship with you are you taking going to take one of those pills one of these days uh, uh, i want to sign up for the program you do yeah i want to sign up with a program i want my wife to sign up for okay. it i want my son to sign up okay. i want my daughter and their families to mm -hmm. sign up okay but um, is there a but in there somewhere or is that fine or have you gotten an, you know okay on that or? i have i haven't been able to sign up yet oh. okay uh, but I'm just saying that's a very real program. Uh, it has accomplished uh, both men and women to move part way back. Uh, not the full 400% of the mind, mm -hmm. but like 350, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, the plan is 400% maximum, maybe 800% greater use of the brain. Obviously, what the Nordics are already doing, already using, okay, because the Nordic guys and girls go to 3,400 years. Come on, comparable years. So this is, again, part of our problem here because we're being taught by the reptilians uh, lies. We're being taught incorrect information, even incorrect astronomy. Yes. Everything is incorrect. Yeah. Uh, this is insane. Okay, but one footnote. The Anunnaki that Zachariah Sitchin talked about, uh, the Anunnaki are these reptilians, are they not in, yes. in most cases? Yeah. Uh, but there are some positive Anunnaki, are they not, aren't there? In other words, that have started to change their ways, let's say. Yes, and uh, uh, we got these blue people too. They got a little hair on their legs, but, but they're nice people, okay? They're helping. And, oh, they're very tall. Yes. Yes. And, uh, but... I've you, been in oh, touch with them as well. In cool. India. Oh, wonderful. They're yeah. good people. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but... We're, we're just talking about twos and threes here. We've got, you know, documented 23 different types of extraterrestrials, most of them being good people, okay? But then we've got these massive capability with facilities of the Draco extraterrestrial side uh, that, you know, they're controlling. And they don't just control this planet, we're just one of their planets that okay, they control. Is Mars under their rule or not? Because I know we have bases on Mars. Yeah. Right? Yes. And so I, I, one, of the, what, one of the whistleblowers out there says there are wars going on because we have, there are different bases on Mars between those bases. Okay, and yes, many people, including myself, have watched partial wars with vehicles diving on top of other vehicles from the coast right here, halfway between Long Beach and Catalina Island. Oh, sure. Four, five o'clock in the afternoon, uh, 2008, 2009, both. 
Okay, watched them both. One of my witnesses was killed. Uh, he was the the um, the guy who ran iPod.org. It's a, a website that was out there, and he had set up a camera on his balcony and filmed wars at night over unbelievable. the skies in LA like, and off the coast. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And eventually, they killed him. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, it's the Dracos or whoever that yeah. killed him, right? Yes. So let me just ask you, do you feel that you're psychic enough to look at someone and know if they're Draco or not, or reptilian and shape-shifted? I, I have said that I don't have that ability. I, I at times pick it up, right. okay? But that's, I don't have that expertise. Okay. But I, I can, for some reason, I know that SOB that was right down the hallway right here when we came in, uh, could be a problem. Oh, wow. And I don't know why he was down the hall. We right. sort of were on the run to get in here because we, you wanted to get started. Sure. I saw him, okay? okay? That's I, good. I, right. And I don't know what that was. Yeah. No, I... He knew, he knew you were here. Yes. Oh, come on. We're so yeah. no, surveilled. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, I, I, you know, I want to talk about AI as well. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if we're completely done with this reverse aging idea. Well, I think it's, it's far enough to say that that's real. Yes. That within uh, supposedly uh, less than 24 months, uh, that program is going to be available to some people. Now, if you have enough money and if you have enough uh, facilities, uh, maybe you can get on the list first. Okay. Oh. I don't know how that's going to work. Right. Uh, um, well, you know, there's also a spiritual component to all of this yeah. that we haven't really dealt with yet. Um, but I also, you know, I, I have so many questions and I know that you probably have a few. So I want to give you some time. So at a certain point, we got to manage our time. Okay. So. Uh, one last question in regard to this whole sort of scenario in, you know, Draco, reptilians, etc. Um, Mark Richards talks about the raptors as being a group of uh, reptilians that went off planet after the dinosaurs. You know, that when they said the dinosaurs went extinct, they didn't actually go extinct. But yeah. they're, a, a certain group of them, from what I understand, went underground and stayed yes. there. And then a certain group actually left the planet. And they're called the raptors. Have you ever heard about the raptors? I've or only you... I've only heard what you've just said. Okay. okay. But And that they have aligned themselves now with our Navy and Air Force. They're closest to the Air Force and that they're working with us because their their queen uh, had was was basically told in essence that their trajectory of their race would be more positive if they align themselves with humans in a positive way instead of continuing to eat us. Okay, I guess I don't know that. Right. I'm I, I, not familiar enough with But you do know it. that reptilians and, and Draco, uh, you know, the blood sacrifices, the whole Luciferian thing, the, the kids being killed and eaten, I mean, that humans have been eaten and taken off planet, et cetera, et cetera, and used for slaves in other colonies, et cetera. I hate to say that, but that's far worse than what you've just said. It's okay. far worse. Yes, far worse. Far worse, uh, yeah. And uh, that, the whole blood situation uh, is, uh, it's unbelievable. And um, right. I don't know how, we say that to the public. I, I don't know how. Well, one, one, wait a minute, it. just a second. On that part of the, the whole, this whole subject, uh, to me, if we get into that, and I know all about it, okay, all right. far more than you know. Sure, all right? I'm sure. <laughs> when we get into that, if we release it. 70, 80 percent of everybody that listens to your program is going to say, you're smoking pot. I don't believe that. And I don't believe anything you people talk about on extraterrestrial. And it's going to kill what disclosure is trying to do. That's but my you opinion. you know the pedophilia is starting to be exposed everywhere. You know that much is yeah. coming oh, out. Oh, yeah. yeah. But 
you know the part that I don't want to talk about. I hear you. Okay? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it, saying as much as you said right now is actually great. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. Because you basically are, anyone who's hearing everything else you say is going to have to come to home with this. And if they want to know more, it's out there. It's more and more, it's out there. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm not going to speak for Bob, but Bob Wood, Dr. Wood, who's worked with me on the, my book, okay? Yes. He's, he's a genius. Uh, if we were in the conference room and we were talking and there was a big table there, he would have his fist like this and he would slam that table. I want every GD thing exposed. I want it all Good out. Good for him. Uh, That's lovely to hear. And I have to say, I'm having a hard time disagreeing with him, but... Well, I, we can do another interview on that subject so that, you know, this one, it goes out. Because I know you really want this information out. You want people to start to wake up. And we don't want to turn them off to any... We don't want... You just said degree. it. We don't want them to be turned off. We don't want them to not b believe what's being said. Okay? I know, but and this... Yeah, it's... And some... We can get into it partially, but I'm saying uh, I ter personally don't want to be involved in doing what Bob wants to do. It, it's too heavy. I All think right. it's gonna. I think it's gonna really hurt getting more people to get involved in this subject. Okay, they're gonna say that Bill Tompkins is smoking pot. I don't believe one damn word. I don't want to hear about any of this. Okay, yeah. I don't want to hear about it. I, I understand. Let me say, because I, I have interviewed people about these subjects and dealt with this sub, and Mark Richards is very open about it. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, but he's in prison. And so they think he's got plausible deniability says no one's going to believe someone who's in prison. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So that's how they allow that to happen. Uh, but I do want to say my, my philosophy on this, which is humans are not protecting themselves. They're not protected. And so if you don't warn them, you're culpable. The next time somebody gets yeah. snatched and eaten or taken away or their child, and it's, I'm more concerned by the, about the children, obviously, than, than anything else. That's, um, you know. that's it. Well, that's what... And so I, you know, that's my statement. My statement is, you know, I care about the children, and I want to protect the children. How can you protect a child? You must tell them. You must tell their parents what's happening, what's really going on on this planet. And it's about time we humans are able to protect ourselves. You yeah. know, there's a lot of New Agers out there who want nothing but to believe that there's ETs, definitely, but they're all hearts and flowers and good guys. Right. Yes. And this is, this is such a dangerous thing to put out there. Because again, you get humans that will not be able to protect themselves. That's and correct. also not understand you know, some people get the wrong idea about Camelot, but I'm actually in favor of the military. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but I actually understand that we have a lot of military that are putting their lines, lives on the line yes. in a daily basis to protect humans that have absolutely no idea that they're in danger. You're correct. Absolutely. I and, agree. and that's got to change. Yeah, it's got to change. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I, I and I, I realize that people have no idea what a brave man you are. Oh. You are, I mean, no, I just, I just wanted the statement made on my interview here that the courage that it takes to actually do what you're doing right now is phenomenal. Really it is. See, I can get away with this because I'm a journalist and I can say anything and people will say, she's crazy and just not listen. But someone with your stature you know, with your reputation and your documentation and who you, where you were and how, where you come from and all of that, um, this is substantial. I don't think people can ignore you. I don't think they can. Well, I, I sure hope they don't. Uh, and uh, because, frankly, we need help. Yeah. We need everybody involved in this. It's, it's not, that's not a lie. We need help. Yes, absolutely. So uh, at this moment, what I want to do is allow, I'm going to get back to AI at a certain point, uh, but I want Michael to ask any questions that have, he's burning questions he's got right now. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, Bill, let's switch gears here, but we're still on the same topic of naval programs. Um, what was the primary mission of the 1946 naval program known as Operation High Jump, and what really happened? Uh, very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> essentially, the war had, World War II had ended. Uh, we didn't win. Uh, it's just sort of ended. <clears throat> and uh, the Navy had been involved with uh, the, the German facilities in Antarctica and the Draco reptilian facilities in caverns in the Antarctica. And this program was uh, well accepted. Uh, and then when Paperclip took place, uh, this is where many of the uh, German elite technical people uh, left Germany and went to their facilities in Antarctica. Some of them went to Russia, some went to England, and a large number of them, uh, von Braun and Dr. Debus and their people, came to the United States. So uh, there's an admiral called Admiral Nimitz, and uh, he got with another Navy admiral, and they formed the largest U.S. Navy battle group that we had ever had with the number of ships and the number of facilities, personnel. Um, there was over 400 airplanes involved. Uh, many of them were enormous uh, flying boats, uh, PB-3s, T TBFs, uh, uh, which were all in this battle group that went to our South Pole to <clears throat> clean up the mess down there, okay? Uh, there, there are large tunnels underneath the water uh, all around Antarctica where the Germans with very, very large truck submarines had been taking facilities from Germany to uh, Antarctica, the facilities in Antarctica. So everybody said, we, we got paperclip here in the United States, but you don't realize that 60, 70 percent, even slave labor personnel were put in these submarines and taken back to Antarctica through these big tunnels to very large facilities. <clears throat> So yes, there were extraterrestrial UFOs there too, and there were some production German uh, UFOs also. So when we uh, got within what you would call battle range of uh, Antarctica, we had already flown half of our aircraft to the other side of an Antarctica with the facilities to enter the mainland from the other side. We were going to come in from essentially the Pacific side. <clears throat> so UFOs came up out of the ocean at both sides. Uh, they eliminated every aircraft including all of the helicopters, air, flying boats. Every aircraft we had were eliminated in about 20 minutes. Uh, we had already started operations, uh, landing type operations, and those ships and all those personnel were sunk. They ended up going to the bottom of the ocean off of the coast. Uh, so Admiral Byrd and Admiral Nimitz, with the tail between their legs, 
took off back to the United States as fast as they could go, okay, and never went back. A little bit like going to the moon and never coming back, okay? So that, that mission obviously failed to do any damage uh, because they were supposed to go out there, pick up a bunch of prisoners, bring them back, and then blow up all of the facilities with this massive U.S. Navy battle group. And we didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> we came back and uh, we're not going to do that again. Uh, I think that basically says what the mission was and what happened. Okay, and uh, essentially uh, you haven't gone back again since, and you probably never will. Uh, so you don't have the capability to fight the Draco reptilian technical capabilities. But there are people going there. Yes. And there are military going there. Yes. And they have also a telescope there that's supposed to be specially stationed to look for the incoming of Planet X or Nibiru or whatever. Well, uh, they have a facility there like you have, uh, your Air Force has at the office Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, there's a picture, a drawing that I made in the front of the book where it shows the command center, which is not a command center, what it is, it's a receiving uh, center for information in this part of the galaxy right. for us. And then you have a separate command center that the Air Force has uh, in that big mountain range. But the one we're talking about is like the Dracos have that the SS still uses which is in Antarctica, and it's a controlling area of incoming vehicles that are not German or primarily not reptilian Draco type facilities. Uh, they could be Nordic, and they don't want the Nordics there. So that telescope facility also is has much greater cap capability than any telescope that we have. And we just had, in the last couple of three months, months, found out that there are two trillion galaxies out there. Wow. Um, so we got better capability, as far as we concern, the ones that the Draco reptilian have in Antarctica is much bigger than that. Wow. Okay, um, but how is it that the humans are let, they, they do go down there, are you saying that they, the, the ones that are allowed down there are Draco or Reptilian, or are you saying that what? they allow them to come and go because that's some kind of a treaty or arrangement? Well, it's just a arrangement between what was left of the SS uh, and the people that are working in Germany on extraterrestrial vehicles, they have them in production. Still. Uh, still. Today. Today. And uh, you went down there to clean that up and you didn't win that battle. So, uh, you... so there's still communication with even humans from here to Antarctica and you have Draco uh, reptilian guys running your governments right. of every country on your planet. Of I every mean, government. There you go. Wow. That's quite a statement. I mean, Does that answer your question? Does that answer your <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not what we want to hear. No. Okay. Not at all. Um, okay, everyone who watches this is going to want me to ask you about Nibiru, the return of Nibiru, Marduk. You know who Marduk is? Uh, and, you know, Anu and, and, you know, all of that. These are the head uh, Anunnaki. Um, there, is there, do you think that there's, are you able to talk about a return of a planet or is it a planetoid? Is it a, you know, Dyson sphere? It, you know. You know, I'm going to have to say uh, I'm not familiar enough other than the title with that operation. So uh, 
frankly, I can't help. Okay. Uh, that's not my area. All right. Uh, and I know about it, but I, I know of it. Okay, have you been told, let me ask you this, uh, Mark Richards says we're about to start earth changes in a, in a sort of a more major way. Uh, what I notice about earth changes is a lot of times they're orchestrated and they're created by, you know, by man or Dracos or reptilians. And uh, that they're supposed to start here, at, you know, the beginning of 2017. And Camelot was always told over, the, I've been doing this for over 10 years, that 2017 was sort of the kickoff date for a lot of earth, so-called earth changes. So okay. have you heard well, that? Uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about a different involvement of that. All right. Okay. I had uh, uh, a cousin who is Walter Handen uh, in our family here, <clears throat> who was three years older than me, about the same age as my brother. And after, um, uh, say, 1933 uh, time period, uh, we were just kids uh, living in Hollywood. Uh, Walter's house was, uh, he was the only child. His dad worked for the railroad and didn't make much money. And so uh, they, they rented a house in Hollywood, which is what we did. Nobody had any money. And uh, so we didn't have, they didn't have any landscaping in the front or the back of the yard. So we kids uh, would, in the afternoon, after school, we'd get together and dig holes in the dirt in the backyard. And uh, Now you told this story on Walter Noasad's uh, interview, right? Yes, yes. So that's where you're going with this. So to save some time, can we like cut to the chase a little further and ask people to watch Walters to get more of this? But you can tell, sketch it out, but don't go as in, in, in much detail as you did with Walter. Okay. Uh, so my cousin Walter uh, uh, be, became a geophysicist, astrophysicist, uh, was later dean of Texas M down in Houston. Uh, one of the five top uh, astrophysicists, I guess, on the, in the country. <clears throat> and so he continued to come to California and he would stay with us. We were living in San Fernando Valley and I was working at TRW and he was a consultant to TRW. And uh, so TRW had astronomy and every other technical field uh, going with many different sub-laboratories sub working on it. <clears throat> and so we were very, very aware of the problems geologically with planet Earth. And this gets into not just Noah's problem, where he had the flood and he took care of it quite well. But there had been seven floods since Noah's flood. And one of those was really bad. But what, what takes place here, and it's a little hard to visualize, um, way, way back, the planet only had one continent. And as we know, those continents, well, the planet was trying to fix its uneven rotation. So the, the planet separated into different continents. Uh, so what's taking place since then on every so many years since that took place? Uh, two major things take place, or well, three, I'm sorry. Uh, one is that every so many years, <clears throat> the planet has literally dozens and dozens of volcanoes 
all running at the same time from Alaska down the Pacific coast to uh, the Pacific coast of South America. They're and, ring of fire. What's called and ring of fire. they have these continuous uh, volcanoes all going. Fouls up the atmosphere on the planet to where a lot of people don't make it. A lot of fish don't make it. Now, then separately, we have this situation where we have earthquakes. Some of these are really bad. Uh, then the third thing is the real problem. Today, as we're talking, the Pacific plate is climbing up on top of the American plate, which would be United States, and it's getting ready to push it down into the magma. And this, this, the same thing will happen in South America too. It'll climb up over South America and push the Andes and everything on down into the magma. So not too many people live through these kinds of events. So essentially, uh, uh, planet Earth is not a really choice place to live uh, from the geology standpoint. We know that there are hundreds of million galaxies out there. We know that there's millions and millions of stars in our own galaxy and that there are millions and millions of other planets which are at supposedly the right location out from the star, not too close in, not too far out, rotating, which produce unbelievably two and three and four times the size of Earth, total ut ut utipities, uh, unbelievable planets, unbelievable atmosphere, gorgeous places to live, okay? <clears throat> so when the, the people in the secret think tank inside of Douglas were doing their studies, they came up with a thrust to review the geology of the planet, confirm the situations with the support of the Nordics, of moving people off of the planet to other stars, planets, that the Nordics are very, very aware of, and live their utopian lives. Okay? So when you look on page so-and-so in that book that I wrote, selected by extraterrestrial, you're going to see a detailed drawing of a 17-kilometer long space transport, mm -hmm. which came out of one of the many designs of extraterrestrial-type vehicles for the U.S. Navy. Okay? Now you have to ask the question, uh, what's the relationship of the geological part of the planet and the fellows that were studying our problem here, which of course was extraterrestrial, but it, then it's also geological. Wow. Uh, and so these two things were put together a long time ago. And yes, you got nice suggestions by your cousins uh, the Nordics. Uh, look into this gentleman, ladies and gentlemen, look at it. Take a real good look at where you live and what is the next date for either one of the three problems to hit us again? Okay. Oh my goodness. What is it? We're overdue. We're overdue for that day. Unquote. Okay. Now, my cousin, Walter Handen, was in on everything that I just said. He was the top expert to the most advanced astronomical space think tank on the planet. Okay? So is he still alive? No, he passed away quite a few years ago. Oh. Real nice guy. Right. Uh -huh. He and I, he brought he and I brought this stuff back and forth just continually. 
and <clears throat> uh, for him to be consultant of the company, com company that I'm working for, you know, that was really beautiful for me. Well, may I ask why, like, can the Nordics help somebody like that before they die, or is that a choice? Uh, I, I or think... are you sure he died and didn't just go to another place? Okay. Uh, there again, uh, a lot of people don't believe that they are, they have many lives, okay? Um, some have more than others. Oh okay? yeah, absolutely, I but believe we it. don't just die here and that's it. Sure. Okay, and we've got a whole lot of other stuff we got to do, yeah. okay? And so uh, TRW, again, in their programming on that particular subject, uh, uh, actually told John Walder uh, almost the date that he was going to step out oh, okay. and told him which of seven different previous lives he was going to relive. New versions of. Oh, uh -huh. And I thought that was kind of cool. Right. Uh, now I can't prove that. I'm only saying this is what he tells me well, it makes sense. And, and I'm saying that uh, I personally, uh, my wife and I, we, our family believes that, you know, uh, this is only part time here. Mm -hmm. You've got a real job out there. Sure. And uh, so there's got to be that relationship. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Very In good. In fact, you're going to have a lot of fun uh, in another one of yours. I know that. You do? Really, you're going to have a ball. <laughs> Okay, um, so what I want to say here is uh, about artificial intelligence, because when I dealt with Mark, we know the, the reptilian and the Draco threat and all of that, yes. and other ET races as well, of which there are many that are still you know, negatively, what I would call negatively based. Um, and, and maybe as big a threat as they are. Um, the Chromaton uh, comes to mind, the Dragon Moss, and uh, there's, an, there's also some other very diabolical creatures that even the Draco and the Reptilians fear. Yes. From what I hear. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And um, what about artificial intelligence? Isn't that a threat? I mean, I was told by Mark that there are some positive artificial intelligence out there, but that we do have incoming races of beings that are actually artificially intelligent, you know. Yeah, you can't even see them. There are some invisible ones, yes, you yeah, said that. Yeah, you can't even see them. Intelligence. So, so you've, you've dealt with this? Yes. Yeah? No question. Uh, and maybe not one or two, maybe like thousands. Oh, really? Okay, with agendas. Yes. And unfortunately, again, both pro and con. Right. Uh, white hats and black hats. Yes. And some of them are, are essentially supporting Draco reptilian type of missions. Sure. And some of them are helping Nordic and the blue people. Okay. okay. The blue guys are really good people. Really. Uh, yeah. I they're. Okay. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, uh, so, you, know, you know, wait a minute, this little dissertation right here yes. has been fun for me. Oh, good. Uh, I'm like having fun Excellent. with you hitting on me. <laughs> with this, you're trying to bang me, uh, you're trying to hit me over the head. And uh, really, you know so much about this subject, <laughs> it's, it's unreal. Oh, that's I, I just have there to say, go, I have to say. Well, coming from uh, you, that's no. I, I have to say, uh, you're beautiful. You really <laughs> know. You really know what's going on. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Really. Well, uh, you know who I have to thank. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to take all the credit there, uh, but thank you. That's lovely yes. to say. Thank you very much. Um, okay. What are we on time? It's 2 o'clock. It's 2 o'clock. Okay. So we've kept you for a very long time. Okay. I can wrap this up here. I okay. think maybe this is plenty of time for a person 
in, of your age, even okay. though you're not always going to be the same. Yeah, age, yeah right. But um, so I, I guess it, you know, cameras are still rolling, and I guess that we should wrap this up. And I want to say thank you very much. I love much. you. Love you. Love you. And okay. thank you for your yeah. service to humanity. Okay. okay. Appreciate it. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart and the top of my heart. And Michael, thank you so much. Yeah, I thank you, Michael. Been a bit thank slighted, you, but your presence yeah. has been very welcome. Thank you. And, uh, and, and we'll try to do this again sometime okay. if you're willing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you did a lovely no, job. I was having fun. You, Come on. It looked like it.